as well. So you can check out the questions. Just takes a couple of seconds to push live to LinkedIn and YouTube. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we have some folks joining us in Zoom. Welcome. Penny. I was really hoping we would have released 017 yesterday. <laughs> Robert and I uh, used better judgment and decided we would hammer out a couple more, couple more tests. <laughs> and as but we have a release date, we'll announce a release date today. I did get him to agree to that. Looks like we are live on youtube here um and it's restream is still sending out to linkedin so just please hold on that and welcome folks uh go ahead and place where you're tuning in from in the chat today Let's refresh LinkedIn here. Sometimes we have some technical difficulties with uh mm. perfect. And that little trick worked. <laughs> okay. We are now uh live on all channels. Let me just sync in here. Perfect. All right. Um, we are live on all channels now. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, feel free to place where you're tuning in in the chat, whether you're tuning in from YouTube, LinkedIn, or Zoom. We are live on three channels today, and you will be able to view today's recording on the Delta Lake YouTube channel if you'd like to send it out to colleagues or just rewatch it. Uh, so we will get started here. Uh, I am so pleased to introduce Tyler Croy. Uh, Tyler is the founder of Buoyant Data, which provides data platform cost management and tooling, and has an incredible open source career of already over 14 years. Oh, uh, my God. <laughs> well, when you say like that. Oh, man. Yeah, I think that's like a freshman in high school, your open source career. Yeah, yeah. I started very, very young. Uh, so, uh, free BSD project, uh, Tyler originally got involved with, he made some significant contributions to the Python, Ruby and puppet communities. Uh, most notably Tyler, uh, got involved in the Jenkins project. He played a crucial ro role in advocacy, governance and community infrastructure. So recently, uh, Tyler has shifted his focus towards two exciting uh, frontiers, Delta Lake and the Rust communities. So um, in today's session, we are in for a treat with Tyler. Uh, Tyler will enlighten us about the upcoming enhancements in Rust crate capabilities. Uh, this is a really great opportunity to ask your questions to a Rust maintainer. Um, so <laughs> lot of uh, open source knowledge here. So um, as you go uh, listening to this presentation, place your questions in the chat and we will be sure to answer them. Uh, Carly, do you know uh, do you know about the Google Summer of Code? No, Are I don't. Are you familiar with that? All right, so Google Summer of Code is a really great program for students to get involved in open source projects. I was in the inaugural Google Summer of Code <laughs> uh, and that's when I when I started working with the, uh, the FreeBSD project. 
that's usually how I can date myself is people don't even remember that that hasn't always been a thing. Um, that that's was a long, so awesome. long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. Remember well, before the iPhone? Yeah, it was around that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those All were right. the days. Um, let me toss it over to you, Tyler, to kick things off. And uh, thank you again for lending your knowledge to the community. Cool. Thank you, Carly, for the, the introduction and the uh, the age check. That was helpful. Uh, <laughs> so howdy, everybody. Um, I'm Tyler Croy. I'm one of many maintainers of the Delta Rust project, um, which is a Delta Lake binding for, for Rust. Uh, I have the dubious honor of having uh, helped start the Delta Lake project in my role at Scribd with uh, a very talented developer, a guy named QP Howe. We started it as a Rust implementation, and then a bunch of other people joined in, like Will Jones, Robert, Eon, like a whole bunch of people have really made the Delta Rust project what it is. I really enjoy building high efficiency data and ML platforms. Um, I'm a big fan of Rust, I'm a big fan of Delta Lake. Uh, I also like bikes. There's some bikes hiding around behind me, uh, but we won't be talking about bikes today. Um, I should also mention I have been asked to, and I'm very thrilled to help with the Delta Lake Definitive Guide, um, which Scott, um, Scott, Tristan, Prashant, and Denny have been working on over the past year or so. And so in the Definitive Guide, there's going to be some Delta Lake Rust and Python uh, contribution from yours truly, which I'm really excited to, to see come out at some point soon. I don't know if we have a date yet. Um, but let's talk about Delta Lake for Rust. So uh, there's a lot of reasons to use Rust. Uh, I'm not going to, I mean, it's cool. There's lots of, of really great reasons to use it. But in the context of Delta Lake or data uh, processing in general, there's a, a, a growing movement of using Rust for data processing, whether that's ingestion or query or, or, or things like that. We initially started creating the Delta Lake Rust bindings in Rust because it's very embeddable. Um, the Delta Lake Python package. So if you do a pip install Delta Lake, you're actually getting a wheel that's built in Python on top of the Delta Rust code because it's very embeddable um, at, that, at that sort of core level. And uh, Kai, Kaija is um, another contributor in the Delta Lake ecosystem. He's got some .NET work uh, floating around. We've had some Golang bindings float around every now and again. Um, and what really makes it in interesting from a Rust standpoint to build these tools is that there's no runtime. Uh, so you're not managing sort of two garbage collection cycles or two runtimes. Uh, and that you, you, know, you don't need a JVM to do really interesting things. And it opens up Delta Lake to a lot more of the ecosystem uh, than strictly Delta on Spark or, or the standalone Java uh, version. Being in Rust also allows us to integrate with Data Fusion, which is a phenomenal library. Um, I can't say enough good things about the Data Fusion project. Uh, Andrew Lamb recently posted a good blog on the uh, Apache Arrow blog about Data Fusion's performance. Um, it's an incredibly good toolkit for building you know, high performance uh, data processing tools. Um, and Delta RS supports it, which means you can just go use Data Fusion and Delta Lake together, which is pretty sweet. To give you an idea of what that looks like and, and what this looks like in Rust if you're not familiar with it, um, this is just a very simple SQL query that's running through Data Fusion on a Delta table. Um, there's a couple of interesting things to note. Session context, as an example, I cut out all of the imports just because those aren't really, really relevant to, to, sh to show here. But session context, and then register table, and then the SQL stuff, that's all Data Fusion. What's really interesting about how Delta RS in integrates with Data Fusion is we just have to open up the table and we just have to register it. And because Data Fusion is pluggable and it works really well, you can go from kind of zero to querying Delta tables in Rust or in Python extremely quickly and with very low overhead. Um, In general, I really like to build Rust apps. I think there's a really good use case or, or space where Rust uh, makes a lot of sense for data processing. Uh, the team that I lead uh, built Kafka Delta Ingest. Kafka Delta Ingest is actually the reason we created Delta Rust to begin with. Um, it's a little-ish, I won't say it's little, but it's a little-ish daemon that helps stream JSON data from Kafka into append-only Delta tables. So think about your bronze layer in a, in a Delta Lake. Um, 
and we've had it in production for a number of years. It's incredibly efficient when compared to a JVM based counterpart, and it's incredibly fast as well. And that, that project, it's open source. Um, if you go to the Delta IO GitHub, you'll see Kafka Delta Ingest uh, there as well. That is uh, sort of the first, you know, significant writer in, in the Delta like Rust ecosystem. And we had to solve a lot of interesting problems uh, to, to do that because previously you could only write from Spark. I also wrote this uh, little tool called Oxbow, um, which is under the Buoyant Data GitHub organization. And the thing that I like about Oxbow and where the Delta Rust library becomes really handy is for doing transaction log management. So at its core, Delta Lake is just you know a, a JSON transaction log. I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit. J a JSON transaction log and Parquet data files sitting in object storage. And Delta Rust or, or the Python uh, Delta Lake uh, library are both really useful if you just want to work with that transaction log. So if you're not doing a lot of big, you know, big data for however big you define big data to be, um, these libraries can really help you just work with that transaction log really efficiently. And so what Oxbow does is Oxbow just looks at S3 event notifications when a tool like Kinesis Data Firehose, which can write Parquet directly to, to S3, or Aurora Export, which can just write Parquet directly to S3, or Airbyte, which is a really great open source tool, um, just writes Parquet to S3. When that parquet shows up, you've got basically one half of a delta table. You just need the transaction data. And that's what Oxbow does automatically for you. And so I've built really high efficiency ingestion pipelines, so to speak, with uh, Oxbow just managing that transaction log. And then you've got, you know, presto bango, you've got your bronze delta table. Um, I've recently been exploring some other stuff, which isn't necessarily open source, um, but is also a lot of fun reporting metrics out of the transaction log. You don't need to process the data. You just need to process the transaction log. Rust does a really good job of that. Um, I've also replaced some tools that AWS has for Delta Lake with, with simple Rust code because it's a little bit faster and easier just to work directly with Delta Lake than to rely on glue data crawlers um, or some of the other you know, built-in tools that AWS has for working with Delta tables. Um, but anyways, Rust is great. You should use it. You should learn it. Um, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Let's talk about 017. So, the Delta Lake project generally follows semantic versioning, and we're in the 0.x still because we're still hammering out what we want our, our public APIs to look like, where we want things to, to, to be. 0.17 is a significant release. I won't say it's a major release because we're not updating the major version number, but it is significant because we have a lot of really great changes that have come in. And we're going to be publishing this on February 5th, which is next Monday. Um, uh, or in the past, if you're watching a recording. Um, and we have so many, so many really useful features coming in. Probably the biggest one that I'm excited about that we're going to talk about here is the S3 Dynamo, DynamoDB log store implementation. And I'll get into what that is. There's a really big refactoring that uh, Robert did to support future kernel work. And we'll talk about kernel. New data fusion, lots of bug fixes, lots of performance. And now we're going to be distributing multiple crates which is a, a departure from what we've done historically. So historically, we've published the Delta Lake crate. And then if you want a different functionality, you had to toggle feature flags and try to get you know, different functionality compiled in. And that works really well to a certain extent. The big area where that falls down is if we have a bug fix for, you know, let's say, AWS support or a bug fix for Azure support, that either has to wait for the whole crate to be released or we have to release a you know, very small version change just for that one uh, you know, cloud provider. By breaking things out into multiple crates, we can publish the Delta Lake Azure crate independently. And as long as we're keeping that sort of major version of the, the core crate up to date, uh, you as a, a consumer of these things can get new Azure fixes or new GCP fixes or new whatever, you know, something fixes a lot faster. In order to support multiple crates though, we also had to do some restructuring that allows us to be more pluggable, so to speak. Um, and so by pushing storage providers like S3, Azure, GCP, et cetera out, we can solve some problems that we've had in the community in the past with incorporating new storage systems. And I call out HDFS here. Uh, we've had a, a couple of contributors come along and contribute really solid HDFS support but because of some build difficulties, we haven't been able to incorporate that into our main release. 
And so the structure that's coming into 017 would allow for a Delta Lake HDFS crate to be published and build independently, but still be incorporated or still be consumed by someone that's consuming the, the Delta Lake uh, 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 libraries without you know, the core project, the main project, needing to modify our CI, modify our build processes, et cetera. That also means that vendors like LakeFS or you know, Databricks with, with DBFS, I don't know if you wanted to do that, but like uh, other vendors can produce their own pluggable storage backends with 017 in a way that couldn't happen previously. If you wanted your own storage engine, you kind of had to incorporate it into the upstream Delta Lake project. And with 017, we no longer have to do that, which opens up a lot of opportunities for us. I'm gonna pause and drink some coffee. S3 DynamoDB log store, quite the mouthful. Um, I want to talk a little bit about conflict resolution before we talk about what S3 DynamoDB log store is. Um, Delta Lake incorporates some conflict resolution logic in the protocol already. Um, if you imagine two users that are trying to read and write the same table. Um, so I've got user one. Uh, I'm wondering if you can see my uh, mouse cursor. But you know, everybody can read at any point in time from object storage. That's not a problem. But if user two is issuing a write and creates the version two of the transaction log, and then user one, which read 0000, 0, 0, 0, 0 version zero, tries to also write zero two JSON, the second writer, uh, or I should say user one in this case, will fail because 2.json, version two of the transaction log exists already. And so inside of the Delta Spark implementation, the Rust implementation, and in any other implementation that exists, if that version already exists, that means we have to do conflict resolution. And usually what needs to happen is somebody just needs to update their version counter and try again. So Denny wrote a really good blog post about this. Um, Matt, I'm hoping you or Carly would be able to drop a link in various chats to that because Denny did a really good job uh, writing and sort of describing the, the problem in detail. But basically it comes down to two writers have to be able, like there's a monotonically increasing version count, counter. And if two writers try to write the same version at the same time, one of them has to fail and the other one, you know, then has to update its version. In AWS, or with using S3, we have a little bit of a problem in that AWS has made S3 a lot more strongly consistent, which means two, two actors in the world will get the same view of S3, but it's still not 100% strongly consistent. There is some eventually consistent behavior in S3 uh, still. And that means that two writers might not have the exact same view on the S3 object storage that's underneath that will allow them to do conflict resolution. Um, this is, I mean, this is not a, a thing that AWS is likely to fix anytime soon. It's been sort of a known, uh, known issue for years and years and years, um, certainly since before Delta RS was created, which is like four years ago, I think. Um, but we actually addressed this originally in the Delta RS crate by introducing a DynamoDB based lock. And what we, do in Rust, uh, the Rust crate version 16 or prior versions is we basically have a table lock. So in DynamoDB, we put a, an entry into a Dynamo, or we put an entry into the DynamoDB table that says this table key is locked, you know, by this owner. And so any other writer that's built in Rust will look for that lock. If it exists, it'll re, you know, wait and retry. Um, and then it will acquire the lock to, to perform its right. There's a couple of problems with this. One is that this implementation only ever really existed in the open source ecosystem in Rust. So if you had multiple types of writers interacting with that Delta table, they would all have to learn how to speak this custom protocol. Um, until 016, we actually didn't have time to libs working properly. <laughs> which is a bug that I found when I was doing some work to prepare for the S3 DynamoDB log store implementation. So prior to 016, if a writer crashed, uh, the lock would not be cleaned up properly. And so you could deadlock your writers. Um, whoops, that was on me. <laughs> I reviewed that code. That was my fault. Um, 
And so there's, there's a high likelihood that you would have deadlocks with that implementation, but it's also a very coarse grained lock. You're basically locking the whole table. And if you worked with other data systems before, locking the whole table is typically not something you try to do uh, when you're interacting with it. So the S3 DynamoDB log store was actually proposed before the Delta Rust uh, code existed but uh, by the folks at Samba TV. But there's a lot of discussions of design and a lot of um, uh, debate had to occur in the Delta community before that was merged into the Delta Spark implementation. There's a little bit more cooperative operations or cooperative um, locking behavior in that implementation. We'll talk a little bit more about what that, that looks like. But it also has some uh, design characteristics that allow it to um, uh, recover in, in cases of a writer crashing, which will happen. Like it's, it's good for us to design our distributed systems with failure in mind. And the DynamoDB log store implementation does. Um, if you go to the Delta IO documentation and look for multi-cluster writes, you will find documentation for S3 DynamoDB um, log store in the Spark implementation. So this is sort of the de facto way, the standardized way for doing cooperative multiple writers with Delta Lake on AWS. But it doesn't exist for current released versions of the Delta Lake Rust crate, excuse me. It will soon. <laughs> The way that it, it works, it's slightly different than, I shouldn't say slightly, it's very different than the DynamoDB lock functionality that uh, the Rust Crate 016 and, and prior use. In that if we have one writer, I should use my, my mouse to point. Um, if we have one writer that's going to, to create a write, it basically does a two-phased commit using DynamoDB as sort of the broker, if you will, uh, of that commit. And so this is a, a document that actually comes from, or an image that comes from the original blog post introducing the S3 DynamoDB log store. A writer, writer A, will basically prepare a commit and put the first part of that commit into DynamoDB. And if that works, if it's able to get that, um, uh, you know, first part of the commit into DynamoDB, then it will perform the write to S3, and then it will acknowledge the commit back in DynamoDB. And what that means is if another writer, writer B, comes along and tries to write that same version, it's going to fail because there's already a commit in flight for that version. And it will basically have to go through that conflict resolution retry behavior, um, keying off of DynamoDB instead of relying on that behavior coming from S3 because S3 is eventually consistent in this regard and it's not going to give us the answers that we want. What's novel about this and why we wanted to adopt this for, you know, uh, cooperation with the Spark implementation, but also because it's just a better design, is if writer A crashes after it's performed a write, but it doesn't acknowledge, a reader can come along and it can repair the transaction log, so to speak. So if a writer crashes through this process, if writer A crashes, writer B can actually come along and complete the write that writer A started in order for writer B to create its subsequent commit. And so it's a little bit more resilient to writer failures than the DynamoDB lock implementation that is in the uh, version 16 of the Rust crate. So this is a, a really, really good change. But um, the reasons why we should be excited is that because we implemented this in Delta RS, uh, we get it in, in Python for free. But now it's possible to have, with 017, it's possible to have multiple writers implemented in different ways, all cooperating on the same Delta table, sort of out of the box on AWS. And this was this took a lot of work by largely uh, Thomas, whose who's handle is Dispenser on, on GitHub, with some help from Robert in, in sort of reviewing and, and fixing things here and there. And what this allows us to do as users of the Delta Lake crate is we can still use Spark for those big distributed computation writes. Sometimes you know, you'll have merges that require a lot of computational power that might not fit in one machine, like you might exhaust the memory of one machine. Um, so we can still use Spark for those use cases. But then we can use Python or Rust or anything built on top of Delta RS to do the smaller things, the things that fit in memory on one machine, like appends or modifications to, to smaller sets of data, the things that Python and Rust really make a lot of sense for. And we don't have to set up a lot of extra infrastructure or compatibility between our Spark Delta Lake writers and our Rust Delta Lake writers or our Python Delta Lake writers. Um, 
So this is this is kind of a big deal. Like I'm very excited about this because there's a lot of code that I have that I can now just throw away once this becomes released. Um, and on top of that, we also get better performance, we get better resiliency, and in general, our, our operations of or our Delta Lake operations on S3 become that much better by having everybody use the um, S3 DynamoDB lock store. Mr. Powers, chime in if there are any questions. The S3 DynamoDB log store is a topic that could have a much deeper dive specifically. There's a really good design document um, that is linked, um, linked in the original ticket. It's linked in the blog post introducing S3 DynamoDB uh, log store on Delta IO. There's lots of really good uh, documentation about it uh, to, be, to be found, but it's a really good design. It's been in production for a lot of people in Spark for a long time. And uh, with the next release of Delta Lake for Rust, you'll be able to get it too. But upgrading might be a little, needs to be taken with care. So let's talk about upgrading a little bit. So it, I, just before we get into that, I just want to confirm my understanding thus far. So like, let's say we have yeah. like an AWS Lambda uh, function that's like mm -hmm. appending to a table. And then we want to run like a Spark job that's like periodically <clears throat> compacting the files. So mm -hmm. like the fundamental problem that we're trying to solve here is that Theoretically, without this system, those transactions could conflict. Correct. Yeah. And Correct. Like and what, the state. what, so um, I, there are systems in production I've seen that have Spark use the uh, DynamoDB lock system that Delta Rust uses. Um, but that means you have to have custom code. And it's very coarse grained, as I mentioned. So there's, there's big table locks. Um, with Rust, uh, you know, Delta Rust 017, you would be able to have your Lambda that's just consistently, you know, appending to a table, for example. And then you would have your periodic Spark job that comes along and compacts things. Those would be able to operate in tandem without any additional infrastructure other than that one DynamoDB table where they're both cooperating. They both just need to have access to it, right? Uh, and then they will be able to cooperate on those commits. Um, there's an integration test that Thomas wrote that basically, you know, in our tree from now moving forward, we will have an integration test that does concurrent writes in PySpark and in the Delta uh, Lake Python implementation and ensures that those always work well together. And so for those things like a compaction or, or a big modification, you can just light up a Spark job that's going to do that. And as long as you're using the right DynamoDB table, you're good to go. You don't have to worry about any... Uh, data corruption. So your understanding when, is correct. So when they're working together in a in a nice manner, does that mean like so we're we're writing with the lambda function, and then mm -hmm. we're trying to write files with the compaction job, and then what does the locking mechanism do? Like prevent the Spark job from running, or how does it? How do they play nicely? The way that that would happen in in that sort of scenario, there's some lambda specifics that y you may need to consider for such an an, an event is. Um, the Spark job is going to prepare the compaction. Uh, typically, the way Spark will do th that operation is it will have, you know, it'll write the compacted Parquet files to S3, and then it will go to create the transaction. And so we're only concerned about the transaction log change, right? So it will have already created the compacted Parquet files in S3. And then when it goes to create that transaction log entry, it's going to go, you know, we'll say the Spark job is writer A. It's going to go create this first you know, first part of the commit. And then the Lambda, we'll call that writer B, is going to see that and basically back off retry until it sees, a, you know, a commit come in um, or if it needs to repair that, um, repair that commit. So what we would see is we wouldn't see like a, a long wait period of a lock being taken because the, the Spark job is not going to quote unquote take a lock to do the compaction and the release the lock when it's complete with the compaction, it's going to do the compaction concurrently. And it's only going to, so to speak, take the lock uh, or start its commit when it's trying to update the Delta log. And so from the Lambda standpoint, that should be a fairly quick operation, both on the Lambda side and on the Spark side. So you would probably see every now and again in your Lambda time duration, you would probably see a slightly higher duration for that Lambda execution while it's trying to basically um, perform its commit, you know, waiting for its turn effectively. Um, 
but you won't be waiting for compaction to complete in order to per perform that. Um, there, there do become there. There's some things to consider with doing something like that. Like I've deployed exactly that system that you described, and the way that I've done that most successfully um, is I'll do compactions on partitions in that delta table that are no longer being appended to. Because if you're trying to do a compaction while you're trying to do all of these other writes within the same partition, there's a chance that you won't um, you won't compact all the data that you want um, and I prefer, uh, you can build systems however you want, but I prefer to have the compaction run on a partition that's no longer being touched so that once that compaction runs, I know that that partition is as high performance as it can get, as compact as it can get. Um, so however you partition data, uh, that, yeah, that can be helpful. Um, but yes, your understanding was correct. The, the Lambda thing I should mention, uh, with lambdas, I've done a lot of, I've built a lot of little Rust lambdas um, that work with Delta Lake. It's in, it's useful to understand the lambda execution model in a way on how it will do retries or how it will handle concurrency. So the default concurrency in a lot of AWS accounts will be for a thousand lambdas to be spun up to handle you know inbound traffic like from SQS or from you know MSK or, or EventBridge or whatever, and so if you have a lot of operations, and I've seen this with um, with the DynamoDB based lock, all of a sudden you go from zero to a thousand concurrent operations all on the same delta table. Those will all have concurrency problems in Rust's you know you know zero sixteen because you'll have a thousand writes concurrently trying to grab the same table lock. I don't actually know what that sort of zero to a thousand will look like with the S3 DynamoDB log store. It should be more efficient, but there is some tuning that you need to consider when you're deploying highly concurrent workloads on Lambda that you don't normally consider in Spark. Because typically we're not scaling up a thousand Spark jobs that are all writing to the same table at the same time. But in Lambda, you have that potential to go from zero to a thousand uh, very quick. Uh, and it may affect how, you know, how much time each of those writers can you know, cooperatively issue their commits if they're all trying to work on the same table. So Lambda is a special execution environment that requires some consideration. Let's talk about upgrading your writers. Um, if you've got a Rust writer or a Python writer in 0 0.16, there's one environment variable that changes. <laughs> uh, and we use the Delta Dynamo uh, table name, which is the same environment variable that the Spark implementation, implementation uses. But the DynamoDB table is a different schema than Rust 016. Um, fundamentally, they operate differently. The Rust 016 version is just taking a key to a delta table and you know some other metadata associated with it. Whereas in 017, we're using this, this protocol, which is basically putting a commit object of sorts into DynamoDB. So the table changes. For best safety, you should halt your writers <laughs> that are using a DynamoDB table um, when you upgrade from 0 0.16 to 0 0.17. There's nothing that we have right now in the community that will allow you to do an online migration from 0 0.16 to 0 0.17 because the DynamoDB table changes, like fundamentally changes, and we can't guarantee consistency with those changes. So for a deployment, what we would be talking about is provisioning your new DynamoDB table, making sure that your, your, you know, your jobs work with 0 0.17, and then halting your writers, you know, halting writers on 0 0.16, make sure that everybody stopped, and then starting your writers on 0 0.17, and then you're, you're off to the races. Um, if there's any questions about that, I'm happy to chat more in the Delta RS Slack uh, as well. It's just, it's such a fundamental change that for your data's uh, best safety, it's best to just turn them, turn the writers off temporarily and, you know, buffer, buffer data in Kafka or SQS or wherever data is coming from uh, to do that upgrade to 0 0.17. How are we doing on time, Carly? I'm assuming I've got more time. You certainly right, do. We have 25 more minutes. Sweet. So where to go, where to go? I have lots of bonus stuff that we could talk about. I also have a, a terminal ready to, to show off some of the, the in storage integration um, that, that we're talking about. So 
Here's some other things that I wanted to share that are really exciting in the Delta Lake community right now, aside from the definitive guide, which will be coming soon. <laughs> but uh, in the Delta Lake community, we are starting to define what a 1.0 will look like for the Rust crate and the Python package. And 1.0 in semantic versioning means we would have a stable public API. We do not have a stable public API right now, but issuing a 1.0 means we've got to come to, you know, make some decisions on what things we want to keep, what we want to get rid of, what's the API we want to continue to support for a, a long, longer period of time, which would allow you in your cargo toml or in your requirements.txt to basically say, you know, 1.0.x or 1.x and then, you know, effortlessly do a cargo update to newer versions of the Delta Lake crate as it comes along. I'm hoping that we're going to be able to ship something in the middle of summer, you know, midsummer timeframe for Delta Lake 1.0. I've got some ideas uh, on what 1.0 will look like. Uh, I'm sure Robert and Will and Eon and everybody else has some ideas as well. Um, schema evolution is something that I've started to work on. So we have uh, a pull request that's open that may or may not come into 017, I'm not sure, um, that introduces the first evolution of schema evolution. Uh, that pun was intended, but it was lame. Uh, one of the challenges with schema evolution is we don't have a defined spec of what schema evolution will look like. But generally speaking, what we'll have in this first version of schema evolution is we will evolve new columns, new nullable columns in the Delta table as data comes in with new, uh, new columns. What we will likely not have is additions to structs inside of the schema. So if you have... Uh, you know, a struct that has a, you know, A and B uh, member of that struct, and then you have data that comes in that has A, B, and C. Uh, right now, the schema evolution code will not add that struct uh, entry C. Um, that will have to come in a, in a following uh, pull request. Um, Eon actually added uh, some really high performance uh, pass through to the Rust writer in the Python bindings. That's actually released in, if you do a pip install of Delta Lake 0.15, that improvement is already out there in the wild. So you can optionally select the arrow-based writer that is sort of working within Python, or you can select the Rust engine, which goes down to Rust and does the Rust write, which does have some better performance characteristics, uh, which is really exciting. Um, there's also a project called Delta Kernel RS, which uh, ambitious doesn't begin to describe it, uh, but it is a very ambitious effort that Robert's involved in, I'm involved in, some folks from Databricks have been making some really strong headway, and there's some other folks in the community that have been, been roped into that. But we're really trying to pull sort of the, the Delta transaction log implementation and what, what does Delta really mean into a kernel layer which we can portably share and reuse across Rust or C or C++ or other native code boundaries. There's a similar effort going on in the Spark uh, uh, implementation. If you go to Delta IO slash Delta, you'll see that there's already a kernel implementation uh, to help unify JVM-based um, implementations of, of the Delta protocol. The, the thing that makes the Delta kernel RS project particularly ambitious, and uh, our, our, our friend Nick at Databricks is, has been learning this, so has Ryan, is that bridging that gap between Rust and C or Rust and C++ is doable, but getting that API to where it's you know portable in the way that we want it to be portable is quite a challenge. But you know, as as we you know make progress with Delta Kernel S, Kernel RS, what that will mean for users is that as we introduce new functionality like support for deletion vectors or change data feeds or you know whatever things that come into Delta at the protocol level, we'll be able to implement in kernel and every implementation that sits on top of that, Delta RS, Python, Golang, C, C++, everything that sits on top of it will just be able to inherit those, those improvements from Delta kernel RS uh, once we've you know, succeeded there. Um, there's also a lot more interest uh, this year than there was last year, the year prior, in doing data, data processing with Rust. There's a really good resource called Data with Rust. If you go to, I think it's just datawithrust.com. There's a lot of really yeah, useful tools, um, uh, survey of the community of that, that, that's building there. Um, but some things that I, I really wanted to call out is there's the Ballista project, which is in the Apache Arrow sort of orbit. Um, there's Blaze RS and a recent addition. Oh no, screen idled. <laughs> uh, there's been a donation that's coming into the Apache Arrow project 
uh, for an engine called Comet. Um, and all of these things like Ballista, Comet, Blaze, anything that's sort of in the data fusion ecosystem, we'll be able to plug Delta Lake into by virtue of Delta RS's integration with data fusion. And so these efforts that are happening within the community to do interesting things with data fusion means we can do interesting things with Delta Lake just by piggybacking on top of that data fusion integration, which is really exciting. And what's particularly exciting in, the, is, in these processing systems is I mentioned some of the caveats where Spark does really well today in that quote unquote big data distributed systems sort of ecosystem. The Rust implementation uh, and how most people are using data fusion and most people are using the Python uh, libraries with polars or pandas or, or what have you typically is sitting on one machine. So you become memory limited. So I have some Delta tables that if I want to do big queries on, I need to load more than you know, 20, 30 gigabytes of data into memory in order to process that with something like polars or pandas or whatever, in order to, to access all of that data. In the Spark world, you have as many machines as you can bring online as workers to process that data in, in parallel. You can break that problem down, right? Ballista and, and Comet and some of these other uh, explorations that are going on right now in the Rust ecosystem break out of one machine and start to look at this as a distributed systems problem, which makes them particularly interesting. Um, I should have put Arroyo there. Um, that's my bad. Um, I wasn't thinking about Arroyo last night. Arroyo is an open source project uh, built by a, a couple of folks, Micah and um, Jackson, and they're building on top of Delta RS as well. And they use data fusion to do stream data processing in a really interesting, distributed stream data processing with SQL in a really interesting way. But there's all of these really cool projects that are, I would say in the early stages, like Comet, Comet just being uh, you know, donated uh, basically this last week um, to more mature things like uh, you know what Arroyo is doing or what um, uh, Ballista has tried to do where we're seeing a big shift in interest towards data processing with Rust and all of that benefits from the Delta Rust bindings by bringing, you know, and benefits from what Delta Lake can do, which is really exciting. I'm gonna pause for questions real quick and drink some coffee. Anything you wanna relay, Mr. Powers, or should I go into some other stuff? Uh, yes, there's actually several questions, so we can <laughs> move on to those. All right. Um, so one of the questions was, do you agree that it's tough to learn to program in Rust effectively, fighting the bar checker? <laughs> How long did it take you to take you to get comfortable yes. with not only the language, but also the ecosystem? <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> um, Rust reminds me of, of sort of an old Unix joke in that Unix is user friendly. It just chooses its friends um, carefully. And for me, I tried to learn Rust a couple of times before I succeeded. Um, the thing that's difficult with Rust uh, for a lot of people is a lot of people are coming to Rust already having known other programming languages, already having known other systems. And I read the Rust book that uh, you know, I think it's Peach Pit Press. I don't remember who actually published that. Uh, there's a couple of Rust books now, but the, the sort of like original Rust book, the one that you find if you search for Rust book uh, online. I read that and it helped a little bit. But what I found was difficult with learning Rust is I had been a developer for 10, 15 years already when I came to Rust. And so I was trying to solve problems in Rust that a senior software engineer would try to solve. So they were complex, they were network-based, they were distributed to, you know, compu computation problems. And that was not working because I was trying to solve complex problems, but also learn this new language that was forcing me to think differently. The way that I finally broke through with learning Rust was I had some simple tools that I had built in Python that are just part of my daily use. Um, you know, little scripts here and there that, that help me do one thing or another, little simple purpose-built tasks. And... I sat down, I had a very constrained domain. This script does X and I rewrote that in Rust. And I then did another one and then I did another one. And so starting with a very constrained problem space allowed me to not think about the problem I was solving, but just think about the Rust that I would need to do it. Um, and that helped me, helped me quite a bit. Um, if you were to learn now, I think I would put async await or any async stuff out of your brain forget it exists um, until you feel more comfortable with Rust and just learn how memory works, how borrowing works and 
stick with very simple problems. And then once you feel comfortable with the language and the syntax, um, then go broach that async await topic. Because Delta RS, as an example, makes very heavy use of async await. Uh, we are, you know, we build off of the Tokyo community. There's a lot of really good stuff to build high performance systems in Rust, but I don't think you can start there. I think you have to start with something simple you already know if you're if you're a developer um, that's that's already had some experience with other languages. Well, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're gonna have to uh, get you on another webinar on how to learn <laughs> Rust. Uh, that, that's <laughs> uh, all right. This question is from Luan, who's saying, "I did not understand a thing about Oxbow based on uh, the meaning. Uh, does it make it easier to write uh, with Delta and AWS, or how how does Oxbow fit in here?" All right, let's open up Oxbow. We'll see how good my documentation actually is. Um, let's see here. I don't know if I've got good good documentation uh, that we can look at for Oxbow. Um, okay. So what Oxbow does, I wish I had a good diagram. I don't have a good diagram in here. But uh, what Oxbow does is it just reads uh, S3 event notifications. So in a simple deployment, um, ba -ba -ba -ba, those I still have to write those examples. So let's look at a simple deployment. Um, so we'll look at the, I'm, I'm just going to use the Terraform as an example for, for the resources. So imagine you've got a simple deployment where you've got an S3 bucket and you want notifications for those. So what Oxbow depends on is the object created or object removed events on Parquet files. So if you have another system, Airbyte does this, Kinesis Data Firehose does this, Aurora Exports do this, Fivetran does this. There's a lot of things that will just put Parquet files into S3. So you've got that system already running. The problem with that is you just get a bunch of Parquet files dumped into S3. And if you're trying to build good queries, if you're trying to benefit from the performance that Delta Lake provides, you don't get that. So Oxbow receives these events. And in this case, those events go into an SQS queue. And then the Oxbow Lambda is triggered from that queue. And so it'll get an event that says, this Parquet file was created. When it sees this Parquet file was created, it opens up the Delta table and creates an add action. So basically, an, you know, I'm adding a file to the transaction log and does an append-only sort of transaction modification. So as files get created in Parquet, or Parquet files, excuse me, get created in S3, an event gets sent through SQS. Oxpo takes that event, says, great, I've got a new file to add to my Delta transaction log, and it performs that transaction uh, update. And that's it. That's all it does. <laughs> um, in the case of the removed, it actually does a remove action in the transaction log. But what that means is something else has to bring your parquet. Oxbow doesn't read any parquet data. It doesn't know how. It just receives events from the S3 event notification mechanism that says a new file exists or a file has gone away. And it translate that, translates that into the corresponding transaction log modification. Does it um, use the same uh, transaction locking mechanism you were discussing? Uh, this is the code right now that is using Rust uh, 016. So it has not yet been upgraded to use Rust uh, 017, but it needs to be. It's on my to-do list. Yeah, getting there. Uh, sweet. Yeah. Uh, next question. Um, is this more specific with respect to AWS? Uh, are there any changes in Azure? So there, there are some uh, improvements for Azure, but they're not S3 DynamoDB lock store. Like Azure's uh, Azure Blob Storage properly has that consistency that we need to do conflict resolution without any secondary coordination service like DynamoDB. The big improvement with 017 for Azure is now we've pulled this out into its own crate. And so Azure can, like, we'll be able to rev Azure as one like changes come out or as. Um, uh, what is it, the Azure Data Lake Service V2 or whatever that storage thing is actually called. Um, uh, let me open this up. And so we have some minor fixes for Azure, but there's nothing, nothing breaking comes in 0.17 for Azure. 
uh, we just have the foundation to do some some much stronger um, improvements for Azure as those those come out. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. So it's kind of like AWS has a limitation in S3 where it's kind of like they don't have the put if absent functionality. So we need to use DynamoDB to kind of add this put if absent. But I think Azure has put if absent, so we don't really need this. Uh, so we got some some nice ones for Azure, some nice improvements, but it's not it doesn't right. have the fundamental issues that S3 has on AWS. Yeah, and uh, what's kind of interesting about S3 is S3 is not S3, depending on where you get it. Um, so there's a couple of different flavors of S3 in AWS. If you have like Outposts or what's that other thing? Snowballs, I think they are. Um, but everybody's implemented the S3 API. For example, Google Cloud Storage, there's a legacy interop thing that just speaks S3's protocol. Those also don't have this, I'll call it deficiency of missing the, the put if, if absent. And so I'm trying to find where the it's um, copy if not exists. I think is is what we call this. Ah. Um, but for other, I think maybe it's in config. I don't know our own code base. <laughs> uh, but we basically for other S3 compatible systems, you don't need S3 DynamoDB log store. You basically can opt out of using that. Um, because they speak the S3 API, but they don't uh, have the same problem that AWS S3 has. Does that make sense? I may have done a crappy job of explaining that. So if you set this environment variable, let's say you're working on Cloudflare's R2, S3 compatible, but doesn't have this put if absent problem. If you just point to R2 as if it's an S3, Delta RS will complain that you need a locking provider in order to work safely. If you define allow unsafe rename uh, as an environment variable for your process or whatever that's accessing R2, we won't complain. We'll say, we know what, you know what you're doing. You, you have an S3 compatible provider that doesn't need a lock, locking uh, mechanism. So good luck, have fun. So there's a lot of things that speak S3 that don't have the same problem. And this is your escape hatch. Uh, from a configuration standpoint to not need any of those uh, locking semantics. Uh, sweet. Next question is, any plans to support proto, proto buff messages in addition to JSON messages from Kafka? So for Kafka Delta Ingest, we've got support for messages from Avro. People have asked about protocol buffer support before. I don't personally use protocol buffers in, a, in any of my work. The big challenge that I, like, I don't know how we would solve that is Kafka Delta ingest will look at the message payload. And so the JSON message that comes in and match that to the Delta table schema to ensure that we're writing the right data, right? Like that you're, that you're not missing data. With protocol buffers, I don't know how we would provide an interface there or in like a, a, a configuration mechanism that would allow you to say, here's what my proto IDL looks like. And so you should be able to deserialize this protocol buffer into this sort of a, like a, you know, a struct. And then that can go into this Delta table. And so it's something I would love to have Kafka Delta in just support protocol buffers, but because I'm not as familiar with, with how people are using protocol buffers, I don't have a, a sense of how we would design that or how we would make that configurable so that P Kafka Delta ingest could deserialize uh, protocol buffers. Now I will say Kaija, um, uh, has done some exploration with Wasm, and he's been looking at it to do data transformations with Wasm in Kafka Delta Ingest. Because with Rust project, with Rust applications, there's not really like a, a, a plugin interface or plugin interfaces, so to speak, are not easily accessible because of some of the static typing um, that we have there. But Wasm allows us to safely incorporate sort of like user provided code into Kafka Delta Ingest, as an example. And so I can't imagine if Kaija's exploration of Wasm with Kafka Delta ingest, you know, bears any fruit that we could probably support something like protocol buffers if we can get protos, you know, protocol buffer support into a Wasm payload that we can then load into Kafka Delta ingest because then it would just be a, a data transformation uh, that we would execute through Wasm. Um, 
there's a Kafka Delta Engineers channel in our Delta Slack uh, that you should join and, and chat more with us about that, though. Yeah, and definitely also, you know, Kafka Delta Ingest is obviously an open source project. Feel free to open a pull request uh, or an issue. Oh, that'd be great. You know, we are obviously happy to collaborate and mm -hmm. add features like that. Uh, cool. Uh, another question. Hi, is DynamoDB the only lock store supported? Any plans to support others? Um, there are no plans right now. There's no reason we can't. Um, Ian and I have been talking about doing something similar with Redis for on-prem uh, deployments, where we're talking about you know we have we have something that looks and behaves like S3, but we don't, um, including that put if absent problem. Um, the protocol, the the way in which this works, uh, if you go into the Delta code base into the AWS crate, uh, let's look at the log store. It's, there's not that much that you would need to implement. So, speak. so we don't have plans. This is where the DynamoDB log store is implemented. We don't have plans to do this, um, but it should not be a huge jump for somebody to implement something else. Now, one of the things that I mentioned about the multi-crate setup that gives us a lot of flexibility here um, in terms of third-party crates providing functionality, and I had it up before, but let me... Um, I had it up for Azure, but I don't have it here. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Let's just go to Azure because it's uh, is you can register uh, a factory that will produce the object store that you need or the log store that you need. So we kind of conventionally expect that your crate would implement a register handlers, and what that would do is just say for these URL prefixes. I've got a factory that's going to produce a log store or produce an object store. And so you would be able to create, you know, my, you know, Delta Lake dash my wacky other log store implementation. And you would be able to plug this in uh, to an existing Delta Lake project with this register handlers approach. And so that will allow you to plug in in a way to implement that without needing to bring it into Delta RS directly as an example. Oh, sweet. So it sounds like it's possible. <laughs> Very possible. Much more possible than 017. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, last question, then we got to wrap it up because we're coming up to time. Mm -hmm. Will it replace the Spark framework? Ah, <laughs> oh, there be goblins. Um, so Kafka Delta ingest as an example. Uh, we developed Kafka Delta Ingest because we had very simple ingestion needs that were just Spark streaming was too big of a hammer to do that. And so we did replace Spark workloads with Kafka Delta Ingest. I think Ballista uh, Comet, I, I mean, Comet's very, very new to the community. So I don't, I can't speak to, to how mature its code actually is. Um, and then uh, Arroyo as an example. They're all, I would say, a little bit more purpose-built than Spark. Spark is an incredibly mature, very generalized framework. And so if you've got a very narrow use case, I think there's a lot of things that we have in the Rust community right now that can replace a specific use case for Spark. As a generalized computation framework, Ballista isn't there. Comet isn't there. Arroyo is probably the closest, but Arroyo's interface is SQL. So if you want to go further than SQL, Arroyo is probably not going to take you there right now. Um, so I don't think, I think Spark is going to stay there for quite a while as this sort of generalized data processing and compute uh, framework. But there are definitely like today status quo, a number of use cases that you can probably take out of Spark and run them faster or more efficiently if you built something in Python or if you went down a layer deeper and built something in Rust. But it is not, there's nothing that's ready to replace generally Spark for a lot of things. Uh, well, unfortunately, we're at time now. So I'm going to pass it back <laughs> over to Carly. Uh, Tyler, thank you very much. Uh, I wish you had another hour of speaking. So we're going to have to get you here again. Uh, all right, pass it off to you, Carly. We're going to need to rebrand this series uh, Deep Dive with Tyler Croy instead of D Delta Lake Deep Join Dive. Join my webinar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Uh, Happy to talk more about this, these things. If you, uh, if you feel like chatting more about a lot of these topics, uh, pinging me via email uh, certainly uh, is one way to go about it. There's a lot more folks in the Delta Rust community and the Kafka Delta uh, Ingest community on, um, on Slack. Uh, we've got a very active Delta RS channel and the more the merrier. So come chat with us there too. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tyler. Uh, also, I did want to give a small plug. Uh, Tyler has an awesome blog, uh, brokenco.de. If you want to check it out, uh, the most recent blog is improving lock performance for Delta RS. So if you're curious to learn more about Delta RS, definitely go check out that blog. And you can catch today's full recording on the Delta Lake YouTube channel that I will place in the chat here. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. I'll see you all online.